Okay, uh, what I'm going to be talking about tonight, community wireless, is a little bit different from what you would normally think. Uh, I think there's some confusion between community wireless and municipal wireless, like what a city would set up. Like McAllen has Wi-Fi up and down 10th Street, for example, and up and, up and down Bicentennial. And they set up those corridors partially to give free Wi-Fi to the community, but it's also, it also serves as a corridor for their police department to feed video back to the uh, public safety office. Uh, and so it does a, a dual purpose. It, it's got several uh, SSIDs, which are network names. You know, basically when you look at the Wi-Fi signal, the SSID is uh, you know, my Wi-Fi or home Wi-Fi or whatever name you, you give it. Uh, so community wireless is a little bit different. And uh, it has a potential to give you some freedom from uh, being watched by outside entities. Uh, through the internet, obviously, uh, or also give you a little bit of freedom from from wireless, uh, not wireless, from your internet service provider. And uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what leads up to that. Whoa. Was it the right one? There we go. So, uh, yeah. Okay, we'll get, go from there. So one of the things that networks have in common in general is that they have a tendency to aggregate and to centralize. And this is done basically to preserve resources. So for example, it wouldn't make a lot of sense for, for Time Warner or for AT&T to run a cable from your house straight to the internet and do that for every single person. They, instead, they run all the wires to a central office in your city and then from there they, they aggregate those connections to another big office that connects and eventually it ends up at the internet. Uh, so that way they can more efficiently carry all of that data from your house uh, back and forth to the internet. Uh, now, it also makes it easier for them to uh, control. Let me see if I can get. I think I skipped through too many. So it also makes it easier for them to control the network. So if, if you're going to be administering a network for you know, hundreds of thousands of people, millions of people, you don't want the, to have to send somebody out every single time to make any um, adjustments to the network. You want to be able to, to make adjustments from your office, from your desk, to be able to log into the person's router or, or their, uh, their modem and see what the problem is, what kind of uh, quality of connection they've got. If there is a connection, you know, if, if uh, there's problems with certain types of, of signals. So those are the reasons why, why networks have a tendency to aggregate and centralize is because it makes it easier for that so that all of us can have better service and have a, a better, um, a more efficient route to the internet, faster service, in, in other words. Uh, now, the problems with centralization and having a, a aggregation like that is that you have these big offices. So you have a central office in your city and we saw in, in uh, what happened is like in Fukushima in Japan where the tidal wave came in, knocked off uh, all their, their phone service. Nobody could find out. There was no phone service, no internet, no way to pe for people to know if, if the relative was alive or dead because there was no communications because there were central networks that once they're out, everybody's out. Uh, so if you, we saw in the, uh, I think it was in, was it Jamaica or Haiti? where we had the, the earthquake, the uh, Haiti. Okay, so the, uh, the cell towers were knocked out. Uh, some of them were, went down and some of them were just overloaded because there was too many people trying to use them at the same time. And once those failed, nobody could get on. And so you have these types of problems that happen when you're depending on an outside entity to provide service for a lot of people. Uh, in fact, even here in, during the 4th of July, if you try to use your phone to browse the internet while you're while the, they're doing the the fireworks, it's not going to work. Uh, there's too many people in the sh in the small area, and the cell towers overloaded. So if you try to browse the web, it just wasn't going to give you. You'll get the signal, but you're not going to get anything coming back and forth uh, for your phone. So these are some of the inherent problems that come with having centralization and aggregation. Is that there are fewer and fewer points where all of that information gets gets collected. And it makes it easier for people to, like the government, to go and snoop on you. Uh, because there's only so many ISPs. 
there's only so many connections to the internet. Uh, it, so it's really easy for them to go in, plug in, and get your information. Or it's really easy for some outside uh, force to, to interrupt your service because you've got s these, these few points of failure. Now, most networks try to build in some redundancy to make sure that uh, the network stays up. But it, if you're in a small area, in a region, for example, I mean, it's, it's not going to be, it's not going to help you if your city is the one that gets knocked out and the next city is, is, is OK. Uh, so let me move. I, there, I had a, a whole presentation set up, but I went through it. And it took me like 50 minutes. So I'm trying to rush through to get this down. Uh, there's also disconnections. Besides snooping on you, the government can just decide, hey, you know what? We don't like the social unrest going on here. What we're going to do is we're going to disconnect their internet. So that way, they can't email each other or they can't communicate. And we saw this with Egypt. And you'll see the list here, Syria, Nepal. Uh, even China doesn't go out outright disconnect people. But they do have a firewall. So that they, they make sure that you can't see certain websites or, or do certain things. Uh, and you'd be surprised. Uh, even Texas, the state of Texas, can be disconnected from the internet. I, uh, <laughs> I was responsible for, for getting a law passed that uh, gave the governor the authority to issue a, an order to disconnect the state of Texas from the internet. Not, the, not all of us, but just the state uh, network in case there was some sort of uh, cyber attack or if there was some problems going on, he could order the, the state networks to be disconnected from the internet temporarily and therefore you know, they, until they could solve the problem. Uh, so it can be done, and you know they they do it. I mean, the government does it all the time. Uh, of course, snooping. We know about the NSA. We've heard us all about that from uh, from the news. Court orders. Um, I've had people call me up, trying to figure out, well, how can I get uh, ISP records or records from you know from somebody from Facebook looking at my profile? How you know can I get that? Well, you just file a lawsuit, and then the court, the judge can say, hey. Uh, Facebook, you've got to give the, give them your records, and they have to. They're compelled to give those records because it's it's a court order. Uh, there's no no way around it for you. So Facebook isn't even involved in the in the whole disagreement or whatever problem you're having, but because they have the records, they have to issue those the you know access to those records. Uh, of course, police can get warrants to look at your your ISP records and find out what you've been looking at, uh, who you've been in con contact with, and so. Uh, that's another vulnerability of having these networks be aggregated and centralized is that it's very easy to find the places where your data is traveling through because there's only so many uh, connections available to us. Either it's going to be Time Warner uh, or your mobile phone. It's going to be you know T-Mobile or Sprint or AT&T or whatever. You know, there's only so many providers, and therefore there's only so many ways that your data can ca travel to the internet and back. <coughs> Now, what I'm proposing is that we rethink the way that we network things. And there are movements right now in, in other parts of the world w that are community wireless networks. And that's what the idea of tonight is, is to have an alternative uh, to the internet. Now, typically when, when we have a network, like we have here on, on campus, for example, there's a lot of records that go around uh, a campus that that have nothing to do with the internet. There's student records, there's presentations, you're sending emails back and forth from one department to another. You're uh, uh, maybe file sharing or, or printer sharing or even just basic authentication to make sure that you're the person that, that, that you say you are. You know, your username and password. That, doesn't, that has no business being out on the internet. That just has to be local where it makes the most sense for you to have that information traveling around. So. Uh, even at home, there's some traffic that you need that doesn't have to travel all over the internet. You, now you have uh, controllers for your thermostat. You can control your 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 TV. You can control uh, your your Roku box. Uh, there's your printer. Uh, maybe your you know your laptop. Uh, even light bulbs now are are connected to the internet. So you've, you've got the whole thing with the old uh, Internet of Things uh, coming out. And so a lot of that traffic, again, what purpose would it serve for that stuff to go out into the internet? There's no need for it. It just needs to be in a, in a small area. Uh, your own personal private network 
uh, where your data just goes from point A to point B and does what you need it to do. So uh, there's one solution that you can use is the, a VPN, which is a virtual private network. So it's basically a, an encrypted network inside of a network. It's kind of a, a way to tunnel through the network from point A to point B. It uh, keeps the data private so that other people can't snoop in, in what's, what's in there. All they can see is that data is going from point A to point B. They don't know what's in it. It's, you know, if somebody is uh, looking through your records, they, they can't see what, what's going on. Uh, and that's one way to go through the internet and ensure that you have some privacy. Uh, you can set up a network, a VPN, uh, for your friends. Like, for example, you could have tunnels set up between your house and your friend's house. And so that any data that goes between you two is going to be private. Unfortunately, you can't set up a tunnel to between you and the rest of the world because it doesn't work, doesn't work that way. It's got to be from one point to the other. But you can set up a network. Uh, there's a service called uh, Hamachi, for example, where you can set up a, a VPN amongst several computers, and they all collaborate. So that, that way, for example, you want to set up a private network that's on the internet, but between maybe five people, 30 people, and you know, all, the, all the communications between us are going to be private. And you can do that with Hamachi. And it's, it's a really, it's a pretty cool service. Uh, you can have it free for up to five users, and then after that, they start charging you for additional users. Um, another way you can help uh, or prevent people from snooping on you or, or get uh, better service, actually, is through ad hoc networks. And typically, an ad hoc network I at home would be you have one computer, and you have another computer with, with Wi-Fi or just a cable, and you connect them one to the other directly. There's no, no switch, no router. It's just they're they have an IP address, each one, and they're talking to each other directly. You can add a third computer or a fourth and then have them talk to each other directly. There's no central controller that says, you do, you're, this is your address. You do this, you do that, your traffic's going to go there. They just talk in general, and so somebody's listening, and, and they'll communicate that way. And uh, when it comes to networks, there are, you can make an ad hoc network wireless as well, which is start going into mesh networks. Do I have that next? Yep. So you can start talking about mesh networks, which is basically the same idea, except that uh, each computer is its own router, or each router basically they can communicate and they can decide for themselves where the packet's going to go. And if one of the computers drops out, then the other ones can can jump in and take over and send that packet on to, to the next next computer. So they're always looking for the best connection back to where they want to, to send the, the signal. So let's say, for example, um, you have five computers, and there's one that has internet, and the other ones don't have internet. They're all going to use that mesh network to connect to the one that has internet. They're going to share that connection. And if one of the ones in between, the furthest one and, and, and the, the one that has internet drops out, they'll just work around that, that hole in the network and they'll work their way through. Uh, so you can add more, more units or, or more nodes and you can take out more nodes. Uh, and they'll adjust to, to find the best connection to the internet. Uh, the good thing about these types of networks is that since they are mobile, you can't really go in and disrupt them very much. It's not like with the ISP where you, you just disconnect the, the ISP and everybody's out of service. Uh, so you're seeing ad hoc networks now mo moving towards mobile phones. People are realizing that if your phone service is out, you have no way of making a phone call. You have no way of surfing the web. But it, you have a phone. It's a communicator. How, why can't you use it to talk to somebody else? Like in the old days when you had a walkie-talkie, you could just talk to somebody else directly. Why couldn't you do that now? So there are people that are, that are, making, up, that are making apps that can do that where you can use your phone if there is no f no cell service if there is no internet service you can use it to call somebody else directly on their phone and have or text message each other and uh, that's that's a lot of what I've seen that's coming up now but it's all based on mesh networking uh, and let me here are some some projects and this is the, the exciting part these are some projects that are going on throughout the world that are using mesh and and point-to-point -point networks to uh, connect people. The biggest one is this one down here at the, at the bottom, wifi.net. It's based out of Spain. Uh, I, I'm not sure if it's Barcelona or, or somewhere out there, but they, they have about 20,000 users. 
And these networks set up because the uh, the ISPs could not they cannot provide broadband fast enough for the community to to use. They they weren't going to deploy it fast enough, so people just took it upon themselves to put radios up on their on their rooftops and connect to each other. And they're doing a lot better that way than if they had waited for the ISP to do the job for them, because uh, now um, I don't know if, if you're familiar with Wi-Fi, the the radios that they have. But there's ubiquity radios and other you know, affordable units that'll give you a minimum of, or not a minimum, they'll give you about 100 megabits per second connection. Now, I'm paying for the top tier of internet service at my home, which is 50 megabits. That's that's the top level. That's the most I can go without, you know, getting something commercial. Uh, so with a with one of these units, you can get a 100 megabit connection. The higher end ones can give you 300, sometimes 450, or even faster connections. So imagine that you had that fast of a connection between you and your neighbor. Or if you have a directional antenna, you can go as far as 15 kilometers, 40 kilometers with a, with a Wi-Fi unit. Uh, so if you're living in, in a community and you want to connect to, let's say, for example, what if the university put something up on one of the rooftops? Uh, that they, they would have a, a web server dedicated just for the community. It's not going to be broadcast to the internet. From your home, you could just point your antenna to, to the rooftop and connect to the server. Uh, you could have lectures or any number of things up, up there that, that is content that you could use. School districts, for example. The big problem you see in McAllen is that the, they issued out iPads to all the students, but not all the students have internet. So is that going to do them much good? Now they have to go to McDonald's, right, to, to, to get Wi-Fi. Instead of staying home to study in a quiet room, they're out in a noisy environment. And that's not helping them any. But uh, so, what if instead of providing them internet service, which is the goal right now, uh, why not just provide them a pipe back to school? There's not going to cost them anything. It's just the hardware to set up a tower with uh, sectoral antennas that point in three directions, and you just point your antenna there to to that tower, and you've got a straight connection to the school. It's not going to give you internet. But at least you're able to log into the school to get to get uh, videos, you know, that supplement your 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 course or whatever information, uh, uh, handouts from the teacher or whatever it is that you want to set up. So a lot of these projects are they're already working. Uh, the other biggest one is freefunk.net. That one's in Germany. It's about the same number of people, a few thousand people that are on it. Um, this uh, let's see. Personal Telco, I think, is out in, in Oregon where they weren't getting phone service. And that happens here a lot. Uh, the, way, the way networks typically work is if uh, you have a new development, a new, uh, what is it called, a subdivision, they're not going to go run cable for you. Uh, they basically are going to wait for somebody to want it bad enough that they're going to pay for the, the company to go in and, and run a wire for you. So they, they're basically saying, OK, we want you to pay for us to run the wire. That way we can charge you every month for your service. You know, so you <laughs> instead of you owning it, they own it. You're paying for them to own something that they're going to then use to, to charge you every month. So and that's happening now with more and more developments. There, there, there are subdivisions opening up, and there's no service. Uh, all you have are companies like um, here in McAllen, there's uh, Twin.net. There's VTX, I think, uh, also that provides wireless service. And there's a, uh, oh, uh, RealPlex is another one that provides uh, wireless service. So, those are your three options for now in the in in the area where you can get can get wireless internet, but it's going to cost you a little bit more. You're not going to get as much of a speed uh, speed bump, or as much speed as you're going to have with a hardwired connection. But if you had your own uh, direct connection to somebody to somebody's house, you would have the 100 megabit connection going both ways. It wouldn't be just you know 100 megabits coming down and one megabit going up like you do with an ISP. You would get the full uh, speed going both ways. Uh, the other one thing that just came out recently was that last one here, Gotenna.com. This is a personal, not like a cell tower. It's a radio basically, and your your phone uses Bluetooth to connect to it, and it's got a two watt radio, and it'll it gives you about a one or two mile radius. If anybody who's got one of those, you can communicate with them. It's only text message. But the, the battery lasts you for, for a couple days uh, if you use it you know, uh, conservatively. If you use it straight and nonstop, it'll give you about 36 hours of usage. 
it's a pretty cool thing. Uh, they just they just announced that they're taking pre-orders, uh, but I thought it was exciting because if that situation happens where the cell towers go down, how are you going to communicate with other people, with your, your relatives, with your neighbors? Something like that could, could do uh, wonders as far as keeping people in touch with each other. There's a, an emergency channel where you can broadcast to everybody. You can do private groups, and you can do one-on-one -on -one, excuse me, communications to, uh, to anybody that's got the, the service. Of course, the downside is that it requires that every user have one of those, and so that, they kind of <laughs> that, that bites a little bit. Uh, but anyways, check, check out these projects if you can, and it'll give you an idea of what mesh networks are, are doing throughout the world to connect people. And the reason you would want to do this is because since it is decentralized, everybody's responsible for their own radio, and everybody's receiving tra transmissions and rebroadcasting them to whoever the ultimate destination is, there's no way to stop it. Uh, if one person decides to pull out, it's not going to bring down the whole network. Uh, if, if somebody jumps on, there's nothing stopping them from jumping on. Uh, so the, these, these um, networks are organic in that they grow on their own. And if, if they lose part of the network, it's not going to bring it down for everybody. Uh, all you need is a, is, a, is a radio on both ends, and then you're in business. Uh, one radio can communicate with three or four that as long as they're in, in the line of sight. So, Let's see, here's some equipment that you can use to set up some of these projects. Uh, Ubiquity and Microtik are kind of the standard for, for the like, low-cost equipment that you can use. Ubiquity radios cost you anywhere from uh, $80 to about $120, depending on the model that you get. And you can get 2.5 gigahertz, uh, which is what most Wi-Fi uses. And we also have 5 gigahertz radios. Not we, but they have 5 gigahertz radios, which is the higher bandwidth connection, but it, you don't get as much of a distance because if it is a, a higher frequency. Uh, PDWRT is basically you can use to reprogram a, a standard Linksys router, some of the older ones. And it's, it's pretty popular for, uh, for using for, for mesh because you can add a, a mesh uh, component to it and then it'll do all of that, that receiving and retransmission automatically without you having to, to deal with it. Uh, open mesh is the easiest by far to do. With open mesh, uh, you can go to, I think it's openmesh.com. And these units, you plug one into the internet and you can get another one and, and plug it into the, just the power. They'll talk to each other, they'll communicate, and uh, they'll act as one unit. So you program one and that programs the other one. And your neighbor can have one too on a separate network, but the, 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 pro the public uh, Wi-Fi signal Will, will be shared amongst all three. And so you can just keep adding more and more, net, more nodes and it'll just propagate uh, throughout the co community. So these are the easiest ones to set up because there's really not much configuration other than a web page. You go to the web page, set up the configuration, and it reprograms them all as one unit. They all act like one. So on your phone or on your computer, it looks like just one, one Wi-Fi hotspot. They, they can't tell the difference. Uh, the only th problem I found from ho at home is that uh, some devices like printers, they can't cope with multiple access points uh, with the same name. They just freak out and decide not to participate. Um, for the VPN, Ytopia.net, Viper VPN, and Hamachi were the ones I was telling you about. Um, let's see. Oh, back on the radios, the Ingenious is another low-cost radio that you can buy. I call them radios, but they're basically just a Wi-Fi antenna that you can plug into your network. Uh, you can use them to bridge again, either across uh, a few kilometers, or if you've got you know another building you want to connect to, uh, one radio on both ends can help or can help you make bridge that gap. Uh, whereas you wouldn't be able to get that much more than uh, most Wi-Fi routers will give you about a thousand foot radius, uh, and these will give you a much further uh, uh, signal. And the last one is Library Box, and we've talked about. I've talked to other people about open mesh and, and community networks. And the biggest problem with these is that we don't have enough of a, a geek, uh, we don't have enough geek density to have uh, people willingly want to set up a radio on the rooftop for everybody to share. You, you know, and then if you're just the only one in your neighborhood, well, there's no fun in that. Uh, 
so that that's one of the biggest problems that we have as far as the community network here. So everybody wants to have internet service, and we're kind of geared towards that because Facebook and all that sort of thing. But we don't realize that, that there's a lot of use for private information that doesn't need to be on the internet, uh, where you just want to share a video feed from your store to your house without having to go through the internet because you've only got a one and a half gigabit connection up. So you're just going to have jittery uh, uh, video at, at home. You know, that's the sort of thing. Am I out of time already? <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, so it, it, so anyways, uh, just to, to kind of give you the, the, the broad view is that, that there's a lot of traffic that can go privately between people who are on a network who don't necessarily have to have internet connection. Uh, you can have your own website that's not on the internet, but basically just to serve up uh, information that's maybe neighborhood information. And you don't want that to go further than a couple blocks. You can set up a, 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 a radio and have people just log in locally and check in, see what's going on, and then get off. Uh, you can set it up to receive signals and then bounce them off to somewhere else so that that way maybe you have one neighbor who wants to talk to another. They'll use you as a, as a go-between to carry that signal a little bit further. And so there's a lot you can do. You just have, kind of have to break out of that, that mold of, of using the internet to do everything where you can just set up your own private network to carry a lot of that data that you that you want. And nope, that's it. Uh, library box, it's a little box like this. You can put in ebooks or whatever digital content. The battery lasts a couple days and you can just drop it anywhere and people would just log in, grab um, grab the, the content and then walk off basically. And the people do these dead, dead drops with uh, with movies, so you can get movies. I think it was a pirate box was a precursor of that, where you could uh, load it up with movies, and people just go, you know, connect to it, download a movie, and then go uh, pirated movies. Obviously, that's that's why it's pirate box. <laughs> so uh, that concludes my presentation. I hope you have questions. Oh. <laughs> Sure, but the, 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 because it is organic and mobile, you don't know which way the, the path is going to go. It's not predictable. Whereas with centralization and, and, and aggregation, you know exactly where that path is going to go. With a mesh network, it could, you know, this minute it could go one certain path, and the next minute it'll take a completely different path because the quality of the connection changed where there's a better path somewhere else. So it'll reroute itself. Uh, dynamically every single time. Well, may maybe not consistently, but uh, frequently. It'll hop around, so it's more difficult to, to track that sort of traffic. Yeah. <coughs> yes, sir. Yeah. I've thought about that, and... Um, I was thinking because it like routers and the, these radios they don't draw a lot of power. It's not like you're not like you have a 500 watt. Uh, uh, what is it called? Uh, <laughs> uh, draw whatever. Yeah. So you don't have to, to provide a lot of power. So a regular backup battery could do, but of course you have to recharge that frequently. Uh, but a lot of these just work off of your phone. There's one called Servo Mesh, and that one the, I haven't used it because some of these you have to root your phone and I. Uh, even though I I I, I don't want to, you know, I'm not. Uh, never mind. So, a lot of these require you to root your phone, and so it gives you a little bit of more control over your phone. But they basically will let you connect to other phones that have the same software, uh, and so you don't have to have a cell tower. It can be no cell tower service whatsoever. You can be out in the desert, and as long as both phones have the software, they'll connect either by Bluetooth or by Wi-Fi, and they'll find each other and, and communicate. So. You They've tested this out in Australia. I think that's where Servo Mesh, I think, originates. And they were trying it out with um, uh, disaster, you know, people, uh, first responders who go out and save people who will just wander too far into the, into the out, uh, outback. <coughs> Servo Mesh? Let me see. I, I think I can find it.
There's another one that just came out, the servo project, that just came out that does the same thing. And they're, they're all, there's no standardization right now. So everybody's trying something different because they realize the value of it. Because well, again, when there's a disaster, you know, nothing's working, you still need to communicate. You still need to, and you have a perfectly good communicator in your hands. So why couldn't you? Um, and I, don't, I can't remember the other one, but uh, you can just search for a wireless mesh on mobile device or Android or something like that, and you'll see uh, different projects come out. And, and so they're all working towards the same idea, but they're kind of approaching it from different ways. There's different standards. Uh, mesh started with uh, one laptop per child. They wanted to have one device have internet and share the internet with the other ones. So they, the, that project kind of kicked it off. And then uh, there was a standard called OLSR, I think. And then there was one called Robin, which is uh, now has become Batman. Uh, <laughs> so uh, Batman, I think, is the standard that most everybody's working off of. But there, a lot of them are still going back to the OLSR. SR is a starting point and doing their own variety of, uh, of meshing uh, software. But I think if you go with Batman, you'll probably be in good, um, in good company. I don't know if there is a website for that. <laughs> yeah. So it's openmesh.org. There's openmesh.com, and they sell the little routers. So they're already pre-configured with all that to do it for you, so they make it really easy. And the .org is the, uh, the, the people developing the, the open source uh, software that does the meshing. Uh, so this is something you can, if you wanted to, you could do on your own if you're inclined towards programming things. <coughs> okay. Uh, Well, that's yeah. So that's why I was talking about about setting up a, um, a partially a mesh, but a community wireless network where everybody sets up radios on the rooftops, and so you're connected to your neighbors, and they're connected to you know their neighbors, and go on so that 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 way, you can transmit from your house to your business, hopping through these different uh, access points, and. Uh, of course, you would VPN there, so that way you have encrypted traffic. But basically, you would have a much faster connection. Instead of the one megabit up, you would have the full use of the 100 megabit connection going back and forth. And maybe there's some traffic along the way, so you get 50. So that's way better than the, the one that you're getting already. Uh, so that's how you would kind of get freedom from, from an ISP is there's, there's a lot of that traffic that is choked. And you, now you see that they want to have um, yeah, net neutrality. They, they want to be able to to pay for preferred service, you know, from Netflix or you know other other providers. So, again, if you have your own network, and let's say you're a startup, you can't compete, or it's very difficult to compete against these other companies who can afford to pay extra to get their to get priority on their traffic. If you're just starting up, uh, and you want to have full full bandwidth. You know, going out, not just the 1.5 megabits that you know connection. You 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 might be better off serving locally, just in your community at full speed, full you know full 100 megabit connections, uh, than trying to, to stuff it through the internet through a small pipe. You, you're better off just going all out and starting locally. Uh, there's no reason why, for example, if you have an event, why you couldn't live stream the event locally to to your neighborhood. Uh, people that are stand that are outside passing by or whatever they can just log in and see what's going on uh, because you're not going to choke like you are going to choke when you're going to you're trying to stuff all that signal through one pipe uh, and it, I th I'm trying not to <laughs> to um, to make it too 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 dense. <laughs> Okay, so uh, the basic rules are 
like your phone, for example, can receive a signal from, from pretty far off, like let's say 1,000 feet is its maximum distance, but the radio is not powerful enough to transmit back. So you have a limitation as far as like how big your battery and your antenna is. So let's say that 1,000 feet from the antenna is, is a, the longest distance you're going to go uh, before it's just unusable. It'll get slower and slower the further away you get. Uh, if you have a better antenna, you'll probably get to the full 1,200 feet, that more or less. Uh, if you have a direct, that we're talking about an antenna that transmits 360 degrees around. You can have an antenna that it only transmits in a certain direction, and that'll increase the signal, and that'll get you a, a little bit further than that. And there's some antennas that'll, that are focused in just one direction. You can do 15 kilometers, people have done 40. You know, but, but it has to be a direct line of sight, so both ends have to be able to see each other. So if there's trees in between or whatever, it's not going to work. Exactly. Actually, yes, uh, radio, they used to be community repeaters. So people couldn't afford to buy a frequency because you have to buy a frequency from the FCC if you want your own private uh, uh, you know, radio tower and all that. But uh, a, lot of, a lot of businesses couldn't afford that. So what they would do is have a, a community repeater. So they would all pitch in, buy a frequency. And they would they would hit the repeater, and the repeater would send broadcast the signal to the truck or whatever. So it's actually two frequencies: one to transmit, one to receive. Uh, the and so it's kind of the same idea as with radio, where you have to have a line of sight to hit that. So that's why you'll see a lot of uh, Wi-Fi towers are up up in the air high. The uh, you'll see in McAllen the the mesh routers on the intersections; they're all up on the light poles. So that way. You don't have trucks getting in the way or cars or whatever, and you'll see that they're not in the center, but they're they're you know as far as our guts let us <laughs> move them out because it, you, you know someone's going to hit it eventually, so <laughs> you want to keep it as close to the pole as possible. Uh, so the range varies depending on on varieties like the size of the antenna, how much power you're putting out. If you have a direct line, line of sight, and if the antenna is directional or, or if it's uh, omnidirectional, uh, so it, there's there's a little bit of, of design that you got to go through. But uh, for the most part, the ubiquity radios are one direction, and so you just point that somewhere, and it gives you the full the full strength that in one in one general area. And so the, as long as the other person's on that end, you're fine. Yes, sir. Uh, well, I mean, you don't necessarily have to use it just as for community wireless. You can also use it to like uh, to connect to somewhere. You know, somebody's got a hotspot, but it's too far from your house for you to get it on your laptop. Well, this is a better way of getting that connection. Uh, but and so you can use it as a for that also. Um, but there, I think the ingenious ones are about ninety nine dollars. The ubiquities. There's a small one for about eighty, I think, and about one twenty for the longer one. And uh, of course, with a bigger surface area on the antenna, you're going to get a better signal. Uh, and then they have um, they've got some other really nice stuff that that's commercials, <laughs> yeah, like a you wouldn't know it, but like the the hotspots. I don't know if we have any here. Yeah, like. Uh, our company sells uh, Ruckus Wireless, and those are about a thousand dollars each for our, just the the radio. But well, it's not even just one radio; it's got like four radios or something like that, and like 18 different antennas. So, you know, you can it can get pricey. But if you want to just set something up, you don't want to put too much money. You don't want, you know, a thousand dollars dangling on a on a pole up on your roof. You want something that's cheap. So that's why I t generally tend to recommend Ingenious or Ubiquity or even. Uh, Amped Wireless does one that, in one unit, will connect to a, uh, something that's far away, and will rebroadcast locally. So it's got a lower power uh, repeater, so that, that way you can you can just uh, get the signal at home. Uh, and I think that's about 100 and 140 maybe. I'm I'm guessing, <laughs> but uh, but they don't sell it here anymore. You got to order it online. They used to have it here at uh, Tiger Direct. For a while, uh, so always shop around. <laughs> yes. Sir. So what family uh, phones or tablet or tablet phones are available? Because like, what, what brands do you mm -hmm. have? All the other local wireless companies, like what 
It's probably me cuz I'm I'm getting like these big white belt privileges, so the older people at least I'm get off like kind of protected. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. 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 Well, they're they're cashing in, you know, because they they can go where cable and and DSL don't want to go. You know, they they can't be bothered to lay the lay the line, so that's where the these wireless serv the wireless they call the WISPs, uh, wireless internet service provider, and so their business model is to provide service where uh, other people don't want to go. Uh, so they have an interest. No, it's because uh, once you have higher density, then it, it becomes more difficult to provide a reliable signal. Uh, whereas if you have a point to point, and those, well, that's that's one weakness of the of the whole project is that 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz are public channels; anybody can use them. Your your mouse uses 2.4 gigahertz. Microwaves uh, broadcast on that. Uh, the five gigahertz channels are are uh, in the in the radar range. So if there's a radar installation nearby, and they sense that signal, they've got to drop that channel and allow the radar to do its job. So because these are public frequencies, and everybody and their sister has a Wi-Fi uh, set up at, at home, there's going to be interference. So uh, it's best if you're going to have local links, you know, within eyesight you know if you can see it you can connect to it then then you have a better chance of having a good reliable connection uh, the good thing about about them is that if they're point to point it's very difficult to get a uh, interference be not impossible but difficult because uh, when we see light which radio waves are you can't see light in transit you can't see light tra traveling in front of you you only see what comes directly at you and so these these radio units are the same way they don't they don't see interference as passing you know, at a, at an angle to them, they only see what's ha hitting them straight on, in the in their um, on their what's <laughs> uh, on their surface or in the antenna surface. So uh, so that mitigates or that reduces a lot of the interference you would get otherwise. And you had a question. Yeah, I don't think it has it built in. I think you can add it in, but they uh, do have WDS wireless distribution something, which, yeah, WDS kind of does the same thing, but it uses MAC addresses to, to link two routers together so that that way they don't communicate with anybody else. Uh, they're just kind of dedicated to each other. It's a monogamous monogamous relationship. <laughs> No, the, I haven't found anybody here. I did set up a Wi-Fi hotspot at my home using the, the open mesh routers. And I also use the same routers in uh, some stores. I have some clients who, who let me put in uh, uh, open mesh radios in their stores. And so there was a big difference in the type of traffic that you get in the stores. People are connecting with their phones and tablets. And every once in a while, you get a, a laptop. But they're connecting maybe 10, 15 minutes, and then downloading something, and then that's it. In a, in a residential environment, it's very different. You're having people sit on that connection and they're downloading big files, you know, movies, uh, music, or they're, they're serving up, you know, stuff on, on uh, <laughs> forget that network. Huh? Yeah, torrent, they're, they're torrenting stuff. I even tried limiting the, uh, the bandwidth down to 700 kilobits to see if, if you know, that would kind of, give everybody else a chance but then somebody got smart and uh started spoofing mac addresses to get multiple 700 megabit connections or megabit ki kilobit connections and so they were able to to bypass the <laughs> the rate limiting that way so totally hackable <laughs> uh, okay well uh, yes sir The people that are using it the most are uh, just people who are kind of activist type who want to do it on their own. There's also some companies that will s set up an open mesh for their for their guests, uh, or like they'll sponsor uh, Wi-Fi at their favorite restaurant. You know, so 
Wi-Fi brought to you by you know whatever company, um, and they'll have the splash page. You, you can do all that. You can even do paid uh, access if you wanted to. You can do a, a capture page and have people sign up and pay through PayPal to get so much time. So it gives you all of that that capacity and capability. Some people are using the open mesh for hotel uh, internet. Uh, so that that way they can just run one cable to each floor and then put radios through the rest of the rooms, like one unit per two two rooms, and then they're able to get the signal all the way down without you know having to to put in a lot of infrastructure. Uh, ubiquity is generally not used by a lot of wireless ISPs, but some of them are using it and they're growing. Uh, there's one in Florida, I think it, I think it's in Miami, that uses mostly ubiquity. And they're able to provide, you know, uh, reliable service to their customers. Uh, but if you, most of the wireless ISPs are going to use higher end stuff. But uh, and if it does a job, just go with it. Well, they're using ubiquity products, but uh, they're paying for the service. It's not, it's not a open project. So yeah, it's it's a wireless ISP. So as far as open mesh, I mean, there, there's projects, but again, it, it depends a lot on nerd density and then people's willingness to participate, uh, because it, it's not. It, it requires a certain type of, of person to be wanted to be open and want to share an internet connection, and it and uh, want to actually mess with the settings to kind of share with things with other people. Uh, so it's not really as widespread as you would think in the United States, uh, whereas it is in other parts of the world where it's really expensive to connect to the internet. And uh, you know, the community approach is, is, is preferred versus having, to having everybody pay, pay their, own, their own way. Uh, so I think, um, let me show you. OpenMesh.com, they used to have uh, inter maps that would show you existing networks of people that are using them. I don't know if they still do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No. I don't know if that's the map. But they would have a map that would show you where every access point is located throughout the world. No. I guess they took it off. Now, the, uh, there is a controller called CloudTrax that lets you control your open mesh router if, if that's the way you want to go. I mean, uh, if you go through the DWRT, then you're kind of on your own on that one. But uh, if you go with Open Mesh, they give you a cloud controller. Let's see. Uh, and Waterford. I think that one might be open. Maybe it's Watergate or water something. Here's one that I was working on that uh, I took down because I needed the, the units to, uh, to do some other work. <laughs> but it'll give you the, the, it'll give you the quality of the signal, how many people are connected. Uh, it'll give you your IP address in case you wanted to uh, remote into it. Uh, there really is no need for to remote into it. You can do this all through the web. Uh, let's see. I'm trying to think of another one. The University of uh, Vietnam had some as well. Uh, I can't remember the name of the of the of the network, but some of the some of the open mesh participants will share their network, and you can go in and see. Uh, a whole campus that's got the the open mesh network or radio set up, and they're all lit up green, and the ones that are that are offline are, are gray, and it'll give you you know kind of an idea of which ones are meshed to each other, where uh, the best connections are, and you can see a lot of that uh, interactively. 
Uh, but I, I guess because of privacy concerns, maybe they've started taking them down. Now I can't think of any, sorry. <laughs> okay, any other questions? All right, well, uh, uh, I appreciate the, the opportunity. <laughs>